The last time we got together, we talked about uh, an important subject of justification, which is the process in which Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, has covered us with his blood and has reconciled us to God. And it's through that then that we have been justified or we have been saved. Um, justification is just a fancy word for salvation, but it's through that salvation that we have that we have peace and hope in this lifetime. And uh, uh, the justification that we have, the salvation, frees us from the condemnation of sin. And sin is what we're going to talk about this morning. Paul's going to expand in the second half of Romans chapter 5 on the topic of sin, and he uses a uh, comparison and contrast through Adam and Jesus. And uh, what he'll show is that we have death through Adam and life through Christ. And so Let's read the last half of Romans chapter 5 together, and we'll get started from there. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, when I first read this and read the commentaries, uh, this is fairly complicated, but it's only complicated because Paul makes it grammatically complicated. He um, changes his thought in the first verse. And, and a, a good illustration um, I read was that uh, a preacher is standing at the pulpit and he announces that there will be a carrion picnic on Tuesday. And everybody in the congregation sitting in the pews is shaking their heads at him. So he addresses that by saying, now, just before I ascended to the pulpit, I got the latest forecast. And the rain that was forecasted for Tuesday is no longer going to come. So consequently, we can have our church picnic on Tuesday. And that's what Paul does here. He recognizes after he writes his first verse that the Jews are going to be going, huh, no, we don't get it. That's not right. And so Paul addresses that for them. Let's go back, though, to the issue of sin in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2. You're, you're all familiar with the passage, starting in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. Very simple instructions. 
work and take care of the garden. And the Lord God commanded the man. This is the first instance where God gives mankind a command, a direct instruction. He says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. So God lays out for Adam what he can do, what he can't do, and what will happen if he's disobedient. Now in chapter 3, the story continues, and we know Adam has sinned. He has disobeyed God. And so these are God's words to Adam. He says, because you listen to your wife, husbands, here is where we all get off the hook. From God's own mouth, because you listen to your wife, Adam got in trouble. And see, that's what happens when we listen to our wives. We get in trouble. Because you listened to your wives and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thistles and thorns for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are and dust you will return. Again, God tells him what's going to happen. He's going to die because he disobeyed. You know, he was free to live in the garden even, uh, to eat from the, the fruit of the tree of life, to live forever with God, walking with him in the garden. And because of that one sin, now Adam has cursed, or God has cursed the ground because of Adam. And Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden and they are going to be subjects to death. In verse or in chapter five of Genesis, we we see a lineage of death, starting with Adam in verse three. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters altogether. Adam lived 930 years and then he died. Altogether, Seth lived a total of 912 years, and then he died. Altogether, Enosh lived a total of 905 years, and then he died. And it goes on and on and on. And this continues all the way to Noah. And at that point, God has had it with humanity. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Do you ever have an evil thought? Sure, we all do. But do you ever have a good thought? Sure, we all do. They didn't. They didn't. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them all the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That goes on to say that Noah was a righteous man and followed after God. But, but God had had it with human race. And I wonder, as our culture and our world seems to spin downward, if God is going to come to a certain point in time with us where he's had it and we'll send back Jesus and we know that to be true. And that's what's going to happen. I mean, we wish for a better world. We hope for a, a better life for our children. But that's not what... Scripture tells us is going to happen. Now, uh, history has shown that, that society and civilization has ebbed and flowed in morality, but I don't think this world has ever seen anything like what's happening now other than before the deluge. But that's just my opinion. 
Let's look now at Romans chapter 5 where Paul deals with this issue of sin. Therefore, he says, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and then this way, death came to all people because all sinned. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, for all sin and have fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? Uh, Paul gives this opening statement to say that Sin came into the world by one man, Jesus. And death came to all people, Jesus, Adam. And death came to all people because of this one man. But all have sinned. All have sinned, and that's us included. Now the Jews, I said, would be shaking their heads. They would be the ones that would be taking issue with what Paul had written. And if you look at the uh, epistles, specifically Romans, you'll find that Paul is very sensitive to explaining to the Jews how they are not better than the Gentiles, how they are not uh, exempt from all these things that he's trying to teach. So Paul changes his thought to explain what he means. And he starts right in verse 13 and he says, to be sure Sin was in the world before the law was given because that's the problem the Jews were going to have. They were going to have a problem with the fact that Paul said all sin. Well, they would say, now, wait a minute. There was no law between the time of Adam and the time of Moses. So if there was no law, how could there be any sin? Well, if you remember back in Romans chapter 1, 2, and the first part of 3, Paul addresses the fact that the Gentiles uh, were sinful and that their hearts were sinful. They knew in their hearts uh, the law, and it was by their hearts they were condemned. And so Paul is going along with that thought, but he says sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. He addresses their concern but he explains, nevertheless, death reigned. He personifies death. He gives it its own personality, and he says, okay, there, there was no law, but still that transgression of Adam caused a reign, a period of time where death ruled, all the way till the time of Moses. And he says, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, a pattern of the one who is to come. Now, how can there be any resemblance or similarity between Adam and Jesus? Because he says Adam is a pattern of the one to come. There is this one similarity. For just as it is true that Adam imparted to those who were his that which belonged to him, that being death, so also Christ bestows to his beloved ones that which is his, that being life. In this respect, Adam foreshadows Christ. For the rest, however, as we will see, the parallel between Adam and Christ is one of contrast. Okay? Verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. What's the gift? The gift is the grace of God. God bestows grace upon humanity, and the sin brought forth death. Quite a difference. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and that gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? And we have the word many used here twice. First of all, with the one man, Adam, and for the many who died, the many in that situation represents humanity as a whole. Okay, For if, the, if humanity died by the trespass of one man, how much more then did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Now, some people will take this comparison or this contrast rather and say, oh, Paul's teaching universalism that everyone gets to go to heaven. But that's not at all what Paul's teaching. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 22 through 23, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will made, made, all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the fruit, first fruits, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Jesus chooses the many. We choose Christ. Christ then chooses us by faith. Where, where faith is absence, absent justification is absent. So the many represent those who Christ has chosen. Okay? In verse, uh, in verse 15 also, I want to point out that Paul uses the terminology, how much more? How much more did God's grace and that gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? This has been called the much more doctrine. And Paul uses this how much more four times in chapter 5. The apostle points out that in the case of believers, the reign of death is not merely replaced by the reign of life, but by a reign so inexpressibly glorious that all those who participate, all those who have faith in Jesus, will be themselves made kings and queens. We will be kings and queens and reign in life. <coughs> Verse 16, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. And this is a neat contrast. The judgment followed just one sin. It wasn't the culmination of Adam's sinful life that condemnation came forth from. No, it was that one act of disobedience that separated humanity from God. Just one sin. Now, how many of you ever get yourself into a situation where you compromise? Just this once. No one will ever know. What will it hurt? Just one time. You think that's what Adam thought? Just this once, I'll try it. That gets us into trouble every time. And so we see a difference between the uh, trespass, the one trespass that brings condemnation, but yet the many trespasses that followed from the gift, that being all sin from all people, from all time, the gift, grace, brought justification. One sin caused condemnation, but grace is so much greater than condemnation or the trespass that it covers the billions and trillions of sins that have occurred in humanity. Verse 17, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus? So Paul completes his, his uh, side thought to address the concerns that the Jews would have. And now he returns to where he started in verse 12. In verse 18 and 19, he says, consequently. So he comes back to ground zero. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so one righteous act resulted in justification for life of all people. Now we know that the one trespass, and I know this is all very repetitive, but Paul wants us to understand. What was the one trespass? Adam's sin. What was the one righteous act? Christ's sacrifice. His willing 
full sacrifice. He allowed himself to be crucified. He embraced the cross on our behalf. And through that one righteous act, we have justification and life for all people who have faith in him. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many were made righteous. Again, this is just repetition. But the disobedience of Adam made humanity sinners. And then through the obedience, Jesus made those who choose him righteous. Now, Paul uses a little word, all, all. He, he uses the word all twice, and it's the question of all. Understanding the term all for those who are Adams, we clearly understand this represents humanity. But in the all of justification, it's quite different. And we read from 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Christ chooses us. Those who are Christ are the ones who receive justification. Here it is clearly stated that the all who will be made alive are those who are Christ. That is those who belong to him. All men are sinners before God. All need salvation for all the way to be saved is the same. And Paul uses this big term all representing all of us because he needs to continue to drive home the point that the Jews aren't better than the Gentiles. God does not discriminate. He's talking about all mankind. Paul says there is no distinction. God shows no partiality. Now the disobedience that uh, Paul talks about in verse 19 is an interesting word in the Greek, uh, parokeia. It is an unwillingness to hear. It's an active disobedience because Adam didn't listen. It was Adam's first sin. And then the verb made, it says that the many were made sinners. How can we be made sinners when we weren't even born yet? Okay, The verb made is significant, and it unlocks the meaning of the verse. It signifies to set down, place, make, appoint, ordain, or constitute. The verb is a passive verb. And God is the implied agent. He is the one who does the making or declares us made. God constituted the many sinners. After Adam's sin, he constituted the many as sinners. Notice carefully that the sinners were not personally guilty of the act of sinning, but that on account of Adam's disobedience, they were counted by God as sinners. Because of Adam's sin, he declared us sinners. Before Adam's disobedience, we were not declared sinners. After Adam's sin, we were a person is not constituted or declared to be a sinner who is won by his own act. We simply sin. If he is a sinner by his own act, he is so independently of all acts of declaration. It now becomes rather obvious what verse 12 means when it says all sin. It means that God made us sinners, or God decreed that we were sinners, and not that we were personally guilty of sinning in Adam's act. It's that God declared it so. Well, it doesn't seem fair, does it? For God to declare all of humanity sinners, 
doesn't seem fair. But it doesn't seem fair that God would have to give up his son to perform the one righteous act to allow us to be declared something different. See, we didn't deserve to be called sinners because of Adam's act. And we didn't deserve to be justified because of Jesus' act. But God did that anyway through Christ. In 19b, the second half of the verse, it says, So also through the obedience, the one man, the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Gareth Reese says that as it is by the imputation of Adam's disobedience that the men, that the cost that the many are constituted sinners, so it is through the imputation of Christ's obedience that the many are constituted righteous. Verse 20 says, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. How is it that the law makes transgression increase? How is it that the law makes transgression increase? Three ways. First of all, there would be more acts of sin because it's revealed what is sinful. Number two, men's self-awareness of the sins they have committed is the thing that increases. Because the law comes into existence, we know what sin is. Number three, and, and this, more, I think most importantly, men needed to become aware of how bad a thing sin really is. We justify these little sins in our lives, the little white lies we tell, the whatever you fill in the blank, whatever it is in your life, we justify that. But we need to understand how bad a thing sin really is. The presence of the law, God's law, helped men's understanding of the heinousness or the awfulness of sin. Remember, our God is a holy God. He cannot be in the presence of my little white lie. He can't be in the presence of that. He has to punish that. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Grace increased all the more. God's love increases where men recognize and acknowledge their sin. Do you want to feel the love of God? Acknowledge you have a sin issue and repent of it. That's how you can feel the love of God. Acknowledge your sin issue before him and give it up. Repent of it. That will bring you closer to God than you can ever imagine. Reese says that whatever the devil may do to ruin man, and that's something that continues to increase, God's provision for man's forgiveness and reclamation always greatly surpasses it. The devil can do whatever he wants. But God's provision for us surpasses anything that the devil can do or will try to get you to do. Last verse. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. While grace reigns, and grace has been personified. For while grace reigns, righteousness is the one thing made available to us. Okay? Because of Jesus Christ, righteousness, and we've talked about that before, is imputed to all those who have faith in him. 
Okay? We are declared righteous. You're declared sinners, but because of Christ and your faith in him, you are declared righteous. Righteousness is God's way of saving man. Have you ever just chosen to look at somebody differently out of love? Someone that maybe you had despised because they were an enemy or, or maybe someone you had labeled as a degenerate but you simply chose to look at them in a different light out of love. That's what God does for us. Righteousness is God's way of saving man. He chooses to look at us differently. We are no longer the declared sinners. We are the righteous in his eyes. Righteousness is God's way of saving man, conditioned on faith and grounded in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Eternal life is evidently something more than merely the opposite of physical death. Did you catch that? Eternal life is more than just the opposite of physical death. We think of eternal life in heaven when we think of that. And all of this is made possible through Jesus Christ, our Lord, as Paul finished. I don't necessarily like being constituted a sinner because of my progenitor, Adam. And you probably don't either. However, I'm extremely eager to be constituted as righteous because of my Savior Jesus. We all, I think, and some more than others, suffer with the idea of dealing with our past, feeling guilty about what we've done. Stop feeling guilty about what you've done and start feeling eager about what Jesus has done and how just by the one righteous act of Christ, God's constituted declaration of you being a sinner has changed over to God's declaration of you being righteous. That's how much he loves us. It's through Jesus' obedience and through our submission to him that we are counted righteous in God's eyes. Let's pray. Oh God and Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for an opportunity to study from your word. Father, I'm, I'm so grateful that you commissioned such a man as Paul, a man with a past like no other, but a man through uh, one righteous act and one incredible vision on the road to Damascus, you changed into someone completely different. You took a man who was a hater of Christians and you made him into the greatest missionary of all time. And certainly through the Holy Spirit and his pen, we are the recipients of the knowledge that you bestowed upon him. And we are grateful. Father, I'm thankful for all of these saints that are here this morning. And Father, it's not because of what we've done that we are saints, but again, it's because you have declared us righteous and you have made us saints. Father, help us to hold on to that, that knowledge that we have, that you have declared us to be something that we are not. And to have hope and faith in the fact that you love us despite of all the things that are unlovely about us. Father, you chose to send your son to this earth 
to minister, to suffer and die, but yet you took his life up again so that we might have hope and eternal life beyond death. We can't escape death. It's part of who we are because of our ancestral lineage through Adam. We cannot escape death. That is physical death. But because of what you did through Jesus Christ, how you brought him forth through the grave, we can have hope that you will bring us forth through the grave to be with him in heaven forever and ever. Father, help us hold on to that hope in times this following week when we are troubled, when we are worried, when we are anxious, and just to have peace. Help us, as the song says, Father, to count our blessings when we are down cast. Father, again, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.